Well, hello and welcome to another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop. Um, it never ceases to amaze me. Uh, these, these YouTube channels have a life of their own and mine is no exception. And um, I keep thinking I've pushed the boundaries of nerdism on the nerdometer so that the needle is bouncing off the scale. And then people send, put, post comments saying, please tell us about that, uh, that nut and bolt on that uh, piece of metal. And I'm like, really? Um, so this is a fairly nerdy uh, instalment of, uh, of the, of the um, of the videos, um, and it's uh, about this car. Um, this is a Bentley uh, S2 that's come in for recommissioning. It hasn't been used for a number of years, and it needs uh, grabbing by the scruff of the neck and restoring, which we're very happy to do. Um, the more knowledgeable um, amongst you will uh, realize that this has got twin headlights, uh, which doesn't make it a Bentley S2. Um, and the reason for that is that the car is a Bentley S2, but in, in the, the early 1960s, the S3 came out in 1962, um, they changed from the single headlight to the twin headlights. And um, various customers of Rolls-Royce and Bentley at the time, it's the Silver Cloud, the Rolls-Royce version, uh, their cars went back to crew for servicing and crew said, oh, tell you what, um, why don't we change your car into a Cloud 3 or an S3 so that people think you've got a new Rolls-Royce or Bentley? And uh, quite a few of them said yes, and the owner of this car was no exception. So this has actually been upgraded to S3 specification. It would originally, as I say, have had the single headlights, um, just to make it look a little more rakish, to use a, a very old coach building term. Um, the bonnet line here was reduced by an inch so that the front looks slightly more aggressive. So the whole front of the car is, is compressed down an inch, the radiator shell is lower, and the front wings are a bit lower, etc. Um, but the real thing I want to focus on on this video is the braking system. Uh, it is quite wacky and quite unusual and quite unique, almost. But um, if something can be almost unique. Uh, but the, the braking system, I, I sort of touched on it in a work, workshop catch-up video. And people have said, oh, please tell us about the braking system. So uh, I make no apologies. This video is about a very strange braking system, i.e. the one fitted to this car. It was, uh, it's a mechanical uh, and hydraulic system. It was uh, bought under license by Rolls-Royce and Bentley from Hispano Suiza in the 1930s, um, who were pretty well on a par at the risk of being controversial. Do I care? Um, Hispano Suiza were pretty well on the same level of uh, Rolls-Royce and Bentley as fabulous um, cars in the 1930s. Um, and uh, they brought out a braking system which was complicated um, and Rolls-Royce actually cherry-picked the best bits and said, hey, you are, have some royalties. Um, it's all about braking efficiency and pedal pressure. So uh, this is a very big car, it's two and a quarter tonnes and um, stopping it, of course, is, uh, needs some pretty beefy brakes. Uh, but it's also that the whole ethos of Rolls-Royce and Bentley, um, and I started my working life working on these cars and Silver Shadows almost exclusively. Um, I wouldn't say hundreds, but it's probably pretty close to the number of these that I've worked on and driven. Um, the whole ethos of Rolls-Royce and Bentley is, was to make the controls and everything the owner interacted with as light as possible. So the, bo the bonnet, for example, and the doors, um, and the boot are made of aluminium because they're the tactile surfaces that an, an owner or possibly their chauffeur, dare I say it, would open and close. The whole car is about, is about everything being an iron fist in a silk glove to operate, for want of a better way of putting it. So the braking system is no exception. Um, so I'm going to just have a walk around um, how the brakes work on this car and the end result we're expecting. So the, underneath the car, this is the last model that Rolls-Royce and Bentley built with a separate body, which was literally dropped onto the chassis with the running gear at the factory. So the operating system for the brakes is mounted within the chassis under the car. Um, it has what's called a trapeze mechanism. Um, and the interesting thing is uh, the trapeze mechanism doesn't start kicking in until around 12 miles an hour. So, um, you've only got 30% of your braking up until 12 miles an hour. Um, and that sounds a bit scary, and believe me, um, if the brakes are not set up properly, 
it is genuinely scary. Um, not only can the brakes not operate at full efficiency and you sail majestically on no matter how much you press the brake pedal, but also um, there can be all sorts of other problems. And once this very delicate uh, balanced trapeze mechanism, it, once somebody's been at it with spanners, it's very difficult to reset it uh, because it's, a, it's almost like a Stradivarius violin. Everything is very carefully balanced and interplayed with each other. So um, I'm going to just have a look at the, the, the nitty gritty of this. As I say, people have asked how they work. So press the brake pedal in the car. That operates um, a linkage underneath, which goes directly to the back brakes. And that operates the back brakes only. Um, and that's where your 30% of the braking system comes from. Then, at a certain point, a mechanical friction servo, as it's called, cuts in and um, actually works the rest of the braking system. But the car needs to be moving for that to work. Um, and this is all dependent on how all the different parts of the braking system interplay with each other. Um, it's a fine balancing act. But the end result is, when it's right, this car stops on a dime. It really does. Um, one of the reasons for that is that Rolls-Royce, in, in using this mechanism, incorporating it into the braking system, made sure, had exhaustive research and development, um, and made sure that all the, the interplay between the front and rear axles, the way everything worked, um, was, uh, was carefully um, engineered so that the car, the, the, the distance, the, the pressure on each tire and each contact patch and each stopping um, ability was very equal. So um, this car uh, does not have what modern cars have. It's called anti-dive geometry on the front suspension. It doesn't have that. Um, Jaguar made big play about it when they introduced the XJS in 1975 with anti-dive suspension geometry, um, which means that the whole car, front of the car doesn't go down, obviously, when you slam on the brakes. But there are disadvantages to that. OK, to have the front of the car dive is disconcerting to a modern driver. They would probably pull their foot back off the brake because it's just such a weird feeling. But um, these do not have anti-dive geometry, so the whole weight of the front of the car and the front brakes do 80% of the work on average on a car. Um, the whole weight actually squishes the front tyres into the ground as it transfers and dives down. And that actually helps it stop because it's increasing the pressure and the load on the front tyres before they skid and stop. So um, that actually works very well and that's all part of the way Rolls-Royce devised it. So, the end result here, um, Alex, who's done a brilliant job of working on these brakes, um, has, has been fixing them up. We've had sent all the, the cylinders, the, um, the master cylinders and the wheel cylinders, as they're called, off the car. We've replaced all the hydraulic lines, etc. That's been done. Uh, it's all put back together and um, we're going to take it out on the road after I've given an overview of how it all works to see if it is actually up to snuff and working properly. So let's just have a look at how the front and rear brakes work. Well, this is the front brake, and um, it's a pretty conventional br drum brake situation. So you have the, the drum that fits around the outside here. Um, the reason, one of the main reasons why cars went in the late 50s and early 1960s to disc brakes instead of drum brakes and why they're still used is because as a drum heats up with metal expansion, it actually expands um, and it, it actually becomes less effective. And not only that, the heat is contained inside the drum. So it's a bit of a lose-lose situation in terms of uh, multiple um, uh, sort of hard applications for the brake. So the disc brake actually as it heats up it expands and actually grows into the brake pads pushing against it. So that's why modern cars use disc brakes and that's why they were such a game changer. Um, but Rolls-Royce were very slow to the party because they had developed this system and generally speaking unless you were driving on the door handles down the Stelvio Pass at 50 miles an hour the brakes were going to work okay, assuming nobody had been messing with this very, very finely tuned mechanism. But the interesting part about this is, as I mentioned earlier, these actually don't work until the car is on the move. So this braking system is completely redundant until the car's done about 12 miles an hour. 
and then uh, the, uh, the friction servo under the car cuts in and actually starts working the front brakes. So we'll now have a look at the back brakes. This is the back brake where the um, where the, uh, the business end of things happens for the initial time and um, you've got one wheel cylinder as they're called here with hydraulic uh, with brake fluid in it and also the handbrake mechanism works on here through a clever little cam system and this is crucial to the operating of the entire braking system on the car um, without these the car has no brakes simple as that um, so um, Paul, if I can just ask Paul to, uh, to pull on the handbrake now and we'll actually see the mechanism expanding the shoes. So just give the mech... There we go. Okay, off. Um, and uh, the shoes have returned as they should do because they've got springs on them back to the rest position. And again, we're now going to go underneath the car and see how all this um, is initiated from um, what's happening inside the car. Well, what we're going to do now, this is the business end of the, uh, the braking system, believe it or not, under the car here. And um, as Paul presses the brake pedal, we will see a, a mechanical linkage above this, um, moving the uh, link to the back and actually expanding, expanding the back brakes uh, mechanically, this has nothing to do with the displacement of brake fluid, which operates the other 70%. So this is actually moving here, and it's, if it's this adjustment of the back brakes and the linkage at the back there is absolutely critical because the whole braking system, the other 80%, doesn't work unless that's properly set up. And the reason for that is this rather clever, this is where the Hispano Suiza bit comes in. This is called a mechanical friction servo and the reason why it doesn't work at low speed this is the automatic transmission it has a shaft that comes out here at 90 degrees into a disc that only starts spinning of course when the car is moving because it's on the prop shaft and inside it it's got this little lining here like a tiny tiny clutch plate um, which is called a Ferodo lining in Rolls-Royce speak uh, because it was made by Ferodo for Rolls-Royce and it's held in by these little tiny little copper rivets that are um, nine of them that are actually uh, riveted to a plate and inside here the as the gearbox as the car is moving and it's moving this plate when you press the brake pedal that linkage squeezes it by a cam it squeezes the two together inside here which means you get this sort of effect so if the car is moving forward it does that as the clutch plate touches it and as the car goes backwards it does that and again um, this servo is precisely adjusted so it spring loads back very neatly into position and one of the problems with these cars is that they're underdriven. people drive like driving miss daisy on a sunday afternoon and the mechanical friction servo glazes over and doesn't have the necessary bite to trigger that properly and that's because they, that's one of the main reasons, if not the main reason, apart from adjustments, why these brakes cannot work properly, which is very scary because we have no MOT test now. And people can be driving their Rolls Royce Silver Clouds and Bentley S types, and um, they have no idea how efficient or inefficient their brakes are. So now uh, we've got that, and what happens here is that this moves, say, forwards which triggers this mechanism here, another part of the trapeze mechanism, just when you thought it was over. This is my trusty brake bleeding tool. It uh, looks for all the world like a jemmy bar, but it is, is not. It's something else altogether. And uh, the brake master cylinders are mounted here, and the rods from this actually work it back in two. Um, so we'll have a look at that, and um, then finally the explanation is over. So now we have the mechanical friction servo moving and hey presto, 
We've got two brake master cylinders of different sizes here because it's all carefully mathematically worked out. Um, one for the remainder of the back brakes, the hydraulics, and the rest for the front brakes. And as the servo moves, this linkage pushes the master cylinders that way and all these master cylinder linkages etc are adjustable so to bleed the brakes on this car you don't press the pedal like you normally do you put my special brake bleeding tool in there and you do that back and two there you go and that is actually how you apply the brakes um, so yeah that is the other percent of the braking effort Complicated? Well, I did warn you. So now we're going to uh, take the car out on the road. Um, this looks pretty good to me. I'm very happy with the way everything's set up. Alex has done a great job. We haven't needed to change this friction servo. I think with a bit of use I can deglaze this, which is um, a few hard applications of the brakes. Um, and uh, we'll take it on the road. I mean, I'll brief with this car. It's not a Concorde car. Uh, at all. It's, um, it's a very loved and cherished car that's been in the family uh, of the owners for many years and they want to spend s some money bringing it back to life but of course we have to start with the important things and I think brakes are fairly important. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll take the car out for a run and see whether the brakes are very very good or not. Well, let's see if that famously complicated Rolls-Royce Bentley braking system is working properly. Yes, what a result. That's what I'm talking about. Well, that concludes another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop video. I uh, hope you've enjoyed it and we will be back with something else very soon. Right, are you ready? Yep. One, two, three. Oh.